Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intelligence, forecasts, and strategies. I'm Michael Bull. Thanks for being with us. Maybe you're on one of the 32 radio stations. Maybe you're on iTunes, Podomatic, YouTube, or the show website, CREshow.com. Appreciate you being with us. Well, we have an incredible topic for you today. The show is called Show Me the Money, right? And we're specifically going to talk about debt. And when you think about debt in commercial real estate, it is extremely important. In fact, a lot of times you'll see a correlation between available financing, underwriting, LTV, and rates, and the market cycle for commercial real estate. When the the market's bad, financing's hard to get. Market's good, financing's easy to get. So there's, there's a lot of correlations, a lot of importance on financing commercial real estate, whether you're an occupier of space or an investor. So please work on my first guest. It's Tom Walsh. He's Senior VP with Grandbridge Real Estate Capital. He's joined us here in Studio One. Tom, thanks for being with us. Nice to be here, Michael. We appreciate it, Tom. And I remember the first time I heard you speak in front of a large group years ago, I was really impressed with, with your knowledge. You guys do uh, commercial real estate loans. You do with all the, all the various sources. Uh, you do apartment loans. So I'm looking forward to, to getting an update from you because it seems like the, the lending market is, is a moving target, uh, and it is real important. And first of all, I'd like to ask you, with lenders today, what's really popular, popular with lenders? What are the sectors and things that they really like today? Probably the most, uh, I guess the most desirable product right now is industrial, I think. It's, it's not the easiest product to find for most lenders. It was, it was probably the last of the product types to come out of the recession. And so it's, a, it's, it's in a little bit of a different cycle than, say, the, 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 the 180 degree from that would be multifamily, which was the first product to come out of the recession. Now is kind of deep into a positive cycle. Industrial is, is not nearly as deep into the cycle as multifamily is. And certainly on the life insurance company side, I think on the CMBS side, too, though, they, they have a hard time attracting that business. I think most people would, would say industrial is probably the most desirable right now. Apartments are still a funny animal. Um, there's all sorts of concern about where we are in the cycle with apartments right now. At the same time, it's still the product type that people chase the hardest. It prices the lowest. Um, it's really almost a contradiction, really. Um, so far, the apartment market looks great. Uh, you know, there's been rental growth. There's been strong occupancies across the board. Uh, very few markets, if any, have turned down where, where, where you're seeing rent shrinkage at all. Most markets are doing well. It's just that a lot of people are concerned how deep we are into the cycle with apartments. We're, we're a good five years into a serious, serious growth mode on apartments with you know unprecedented rental growth over that period of time. So that concerns some people. Uh, but right now, right now, it's just concern. It really hasn't manifested itself in problems yet. The other two, you know, retail is kind of steady as she goes right now. Um, our company had a very strong year in 2015 with retail. The retail market, by and large, is doing well. The, the country seems to have kind of figured out its big box situation, which, as you may know, five, six years ago was kind of a brutal situation with big boxes everywhere in the country empty whether it be the old Kmarts or, you know, you know, say other furniture companies that went out of business, people like that. That seems to have stabilized now. Uh, and office, um, I think most people would tell you that office has come back better than anyone thought it could. Uh, it was probably the product that was at the bottom of the barrel five or six years ago in the recession. Uh, most markets in the United States uh, have seen a pretty good rebound in office. Most office markets are doing fairly well, better than anyone would have anticipated. They're, they're more financeable now than I would have guessed they would have been, clearly. So it sounds like there's not really a property type that lenders are really shying away from. I would say no, uh, other, uh, other than some anecdotal concern on multifamily. Um, and especially, I, I would say, across the country, there's a lot of in-town multifamily. That, that's that's kind of the, the chic product right now is the is the in-town. A lot of it is wrap product where you have, we, we have apartments wrapped around a parking garage with an elevator, you know, building. Um, 
there is some anecdotal concern that, 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 that you know, we have a lot of that on the market right now. However, up to this point, it's been all well absorbed. Mar you know, rates, the rental rates continue to rise. Yeah. It's plenty of demand. And the Fed, I guess, was in December, raised their rate uh, a little bit, about a quarter of a point. How is that uh, relating to actual borrowers' rates on some of the loans you're doing today? What's the trend for rates? Um, that really had literally almost no effect in our world. Um, as you know, LIBOR did not move much at all based on that. Um, spreads have increased kind of across the board. But at the same time, your indexes, your treasury indexes have come down rather substantially since the beginning of the year. Uh, right now, you have nominal rates uh, on, you, if you just want to say a typical mortgage rate, you know, a $10 million industrial deal. Um, on, on, on a 10-year basis, uh, you may very well be back under 4% on, under again, where if you go back to the end of last year, you were up in the low to mid fours. Um, there's a discrepancy or, or a divergence right now as to the source of money and where rates are. The life insurance companies uh, who are doing uh, a lot of the, I, I would say, traditional commercial mortgage business right now, their, their rates have been fairly steady and their spreads, uh, especially, especially on lower leverage stuff, are very aggressive. The CMBS market and, and, and those spreads are affected by the bond, you know, by the reselling of the bonds and that, and that product type. That's been really negatively impacted. That filters its way into Fannie and Freddie a little bit, not to the same degree that it is in the CMBS market, but to some degree, you're seeing spreads widen and widen on those product types over the last you know, two or three months. Life insurance company, those have been kind of steady. And, and there's a pretty, uh, a pretty big gap right now on on where life insurance company nominal rates are, and where CMBS and Fannie and Fannie and Freddie rates are right now. Well, to get those great rates from the life insurance companies, do you have to have an A product in one of the major markets, or you really need to have a, a relatively conservative loan, and that can be defined several ways. Um, you know. If you get up into the 70% or above loan to value range, you're gonna get away from a lot of the life insurance companies. Uh, they really like to play in loan to values that start in the 60s and are, and are lower than so that. So they will do um, smaller markets? They'll do smaller markets. They'll okay. do all the product types. They will even get in on, on what I would say the high quality multifamily stuff. They'll get in and battle at 75% loan to value on that stuff. Will they do that B stuff. product? Sure. Sure, okay. sure. But by and large, the life insurance industry plays below the max leverage levels. The max leverage levels are really the CMBS world and, 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 and Freddie and Fannie to some degree. And what are those levels? Basically 75. There, there's, there are some 80% first mortgage loans available on acquisitions, only on acquisitions. There's really little if any 80% refi business done out there in the world today. Most of your refi business is done at 75 or lower. The life insurance companies, as I said, they really kind of play in the LTVs in the, say, in the 60s or below. There are some life insurance companies that don't go over 65, as, as a rule, don't go over 65. Um, those life insurance, they tend to be very, very low rates on, the, on those people but they're not gonna push up the leverage scale, but they'll be very competitive on rates. How about if you're a borrower and you like to get more term? I think one of the things that scares a lot of investors are these balloons coming at the wrong time. That is available all across the life insurance world. Um, we have upwards to, to 25 year fully amortizing loans. Nice. In life company world, we do a lot of 15 and 20 fully amortizing loans on especially in the lower leverage levels. Uh, cause, I mean, you need a fairly low leverage deal to do a 15 year full pay and have it work you know, financially or a 20 year full pay. Um, Fannie Mae, uh, most people really aren't even aware of this. Fannie Mae has a 30-30 product. Uh, they don't do a lot of business in that product line, but it's out there, it's available. We can price a deal you know, And today. why don't they do much business in is the rate um, The rates are higher, right. the rates are higher for that. Uh, now, what's interesting, when you do that, that fully amortizing product like that, you think a 10-year you know, deal and a 30-year deal are 20 years different. The reality is they're only about five years different as far as the rates are concerned. 
but you're going to pay a premium to get a 30-year fully amortizing deal, a higher rate. But the product is available out yeah. there. Well, it certainly takes a lot of the risk out of, of a real estate investment. Uh, all of us that, uh, like you and I, that have been in business a long time have certainly seen the situation where a call comes up and property otherwise is doing fine, but it doesn't work at that time and you have a problem. Well, stay tuned. After a short break, we'll have more on the debt market. Show me the money. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. Stay with us. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you in part by your friends at Bull Realty. When your business requires proven performance, visit bullrealty.com or call 800-408-BULL. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Ball. Today our topic is Show Me the Money. We have Tom Walsh here, Senior VP with Grandbridge Real Estate Capital. And uh, Tom, one of the things that uh, can really impact commercial real estate is uh, underwriting. And we had the uh, Brian Bailey with the Fed in here recently and did a show with him. And he seemed to indicate that, uh, that the Fed might be advising banks to, to be a little more uh, prudent with their underwriting. What are you seeing uh, day to day? We're, we're hearing that anecdotally, that uh, especially in the group of the larger banks in the country, that the regulators are, are watching fairly closely, that they're maintaining underwriting standards uh, and not getting it too loosey-goosey as they try to compete for business. Um, and so I, I would say that's probably accurate from what we hear. But it's not loosey goosey, is it? It's not at all. No, <laughs> even even the, it, it, it's kind of funny in the, in, the, in this post recession market. I don't think anybody has really lost their discipline on underwriting. Even the CMBS world, who are kind of known as to be the being the most aggressive underwriters, when you do a CMBS loan, you don't find anything they do to be overly aggressive. Yeah. Um, as far as their treatment of expenses, their treatment of vacancy rates, their treatment of TI and LC reserves on commercial deals, none of it seems very aggressive, really. And certainly the banks don't underwrite aggressively. Life insurance companies, that, that, that their, their mantra is to not be overly aggressive in, in underwriting. So I, I'm, I'm not sure where there is aggressive underwriting going on out there. Maybe in, in the mezzanine products, the, the products that are layered on top of the senior loans, mm -hmm. possibly, you know, when, you know, they get paid very well to take risk in that market. However, that is primarily an unregulated market. They don't have anyone looking over their shoulder. Um, I, I would say, though, by and large, there's pretty good discipline in underwriting out there in the world right now. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that borrowers need to be careful with is if they have a, a favorite bank, and uh, they've talked to their bank about uh, refinancing their building or, or buying a property, and that bank says, absolutely not. Uh, no one's going to uh, loan on that. We had that happen the other day, and uh, uh, lender was just convincing this borrower, there's no way and no one's going to loan on that. And then a local bank looked at it, loved it. Actually, two banks then were fighting over it. So I think the borrowers, they need to be careful with, with taking just one piece of advice from a lender, right? Well, what you just described is why we exist, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the, why the mortgage banking industry exists. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't go as, as far as to say that where there's always someone to make you a loan. Yeah, there is. But in 99% <laughs> of the cases, there is someone to make you a loan. Yeah. Um, and it may not be who you want it to be. Yeah. It may not price, be priced the way you'd like it to be priced, but there's someone out there to make you a loan if you need it badly enough. Right. What type of advice would you give? One of the things that we're seeing with some of our clients today is that because of the underwriter, the uh, regulators, pressure on the banks, uh, they may have a property that uh, has a vacancy, uh, and then all of a sudden the lender, maybe it's maturity, or maybe the lender's just looking at the loan, they see a large vacancy at that particular time, they come to the borrower and say, all right, you're, you're not hitting the debt coverage ratios, uh, you need to pay down this loan uh, or else. What advice would you give them? Um, I would say the most important thing in that situation is to be the proactive one. Um, you probably know better than they know what your ability is to repay their loan. If you, if you feel like you have a maturity looming 
and you're not going to be able to pay that loan off at that maturity, go to them first. Don't wait them to come. Don't wait for them to come to you. And that's great advice, yeah. but I think a lot of borrowers think, well, no, I'm going to pay it. I have other assets and cash flow, and I'm going to pay it. So they don't think about being proactive, and it's the lender that comes to them and when you know and says, well, there's a problem. If, you, if your borrower has the wherewithal, it has alternative sources to make the, that payment with, mm -hmm. or to pay that loan down, as you mentioned earlier then that's a great resolution to a problem. I, a debt pay down is always the best possible resolution from the lending side. Well, yeah, from the lending, the lending side. side. Maybe not, not, not from the borrower, the borrower side, side, maybe, but certainly from the lending side. If you can what we call right size the loan, yeah. um, most, uh, there may be a lender out there that won't work with you. I'm not aware of one. Most lenders will work with you if, one of, if part of your plan come to them is, look, at, I'm, I'm going to write you a check for X, mm -hmm. and that's going to take me down. It's going to get me back to a one, two, five debt cover mm -hmm. on this. I don't think there's a lender out there that won't listen to that rationale. Yeah. Well, I think it, uh, it depends on the bank, right, and the particular situation. Well, one of the things you have now that's different, and, yeah. and, and, and if, you, if you contrast that to the workouts done, say, in 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. When, when the banks were hurting almost as much as the borrowers were hurting at that time. Now you have a situation where there are, there are instances where for specific deal reasons or borrower reasons, you might have a deal that's in distress, all right? But the banks, by and large, are in good condition right now. Right. They, they're not under pressure for solvency. They may be under pressures for regulatory reasons or whatnot, but solvency's not one of yeah, them. Yeah, they're doing well. Like right. it was five, six years ago. Which is great for the economy. It's great. It's great for the economy, but it, it also, you're, you're just a small aggravation to them. <laughs> now, they may be more willing to work with you. How, how'd you know I aggravate my banks? What? <laughs> Everyone aggravates their banks, you know, anytime you have to call them generally. But, but by and large, They'll work with you now where they might not, be, may, might not have been able to work with you five years ago because of the depth of the problems that they dealt with. Let's say you have 100 loans on your problem loan list, mm -hmm. all right? Your goal at that time is to get that list to 80, right. Right. all right? And so you have to get rid of 20 of them. And get, getting rid of them may mean in a lot of cases, let's foreclose, let's get that out of here. Right. Take it back, get it out of here, let's get this list down. If you've got a bank that has a list of problem loan lists, has three people on it right now, they don't have that pressure. Yeah. Now, they, they, they have time. As long as you have the wherewithal and you have the attitude to work with them, more likely they're going to work with you. Right. But be proactive. Don't, don't wait for them to make the first move. You make the first and move. That's great advice. And get yeah. out there early, right? Yes. And see what other sources there yeah. are. Because you could come down if the lender really does want you to pay it down. And if you don't want to or don't have the funds available. And, and, and there, are, there are other products out there in the marketplace that are more aggressive bridge products yeah. that might be able to step in and might be able to help you out, get that loan paid off. Right. I wouldn't tell you that they're going to be cheap. Right, you might not get your 4% right. loan. Or they're going to be easy. But, but you might not have to come out of pocket a million dollars. Or, or you might not lose your property. Right, right. <laughs> more importantly. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the best sources for some of the various property types real quick. Let's touch on some of them. So let's say I have a, a B apartment community uh, that's worth you know $15 million. Who's the best source? Uh, let's, let's break it up by leverage level. Okay. Uh, at 75%. Your best source is going to be Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac at that point. Secondarily, if, if, there's, if there's a reason why that it doesn't qualify as a Fannie or Freddie deal, then CMBS is your best alternative. CMBS is actually a pretty good product for multifamily because you don't have the TI and LC reserves that you have in commercial property. And that's one of the, one of the things that separates CMBS from the, from, from the rest of the world is those reserve deals that can be very, very onerous in certain cases. You don't have those in multifamily. If you're, let's say, at at seventy percent or lower, then I, w I would think your first call is probably to the life insurance industry at that point. Um, a little easier, a little friendlier uh, today, a little bit of a lower rate than you're going to get from the agencies, um, and and they can handle everything, say, from seventy percent down. And I'll, I'll make one caveat. Uh, and you said a B property, and and, and I, I would say that's accurate in the B property. If you've got an A property. Uh, the life insurance company industry will get up into that 75% LTV range in battle with, the, with Fannie and Freddie for that okay. product. Take a short break. We'll be back with Show Me the Money with Tom Walsh. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. We'll be right back.
Excelligen, the resource professionals like CCIMs, CBRE, JLL, Colliers, and Bull Realty use for market intelligence. Commercial Search is the site to market and find available properties to buy, sell, or lease all over the country. Visit CommercialSearch.com. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Ball. Today our show topic is show me the money. We're talking about debt, one of the most important pieces of a commercial real estate transaction. We're talking with Tom Walsh. He's Senior VP with Grandbridge Real Estate Capital. And we were talking before the break about some of the best sources for some of the different borrowers and property types. What about owner occupants or uh, users as we're sometimes called? Um, some of the life insurance companies have programs for owner occupants. Uh, there are also some special bank programs that, that are specifically for owner-occupied property. It's not, it's not the easiest property to finance, really? but there, there's, enough, yeah. uh, there's enough money out there to do it. Well, we can find it, usually. Yeah. Is there a better loan-to-value ratio for an owner-occupant in a commercial deal sometimes? It's, it's, fairly, it, it's a little harder to value in some cases because you, know, you have to value the real estate kind of separate from the business because that's really what all they're getting as far as the collateral is the real estate right. goes and so you have to kind of value it as if it was income property at that point uh, based mainly on comparables not really the income approach yeah. um, but it's it's doable it's yeah. doable. we help a lot of companies buy buildings and sell buildings for, uh, that they own or occupy and it seems like because of that there's a lot of banks sitting on us and uh, to, to do those loans, and it seems like they want the other banking services for that. That's exactly right. You, yeah. you know, the reason why a bank wants into that business is if they make that company that mortgage loan, yeah. the first thing they're going to do is call on them for their DDA business. Mm -hmm. if, 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 if it's a fairly large company, the wealth management side of things, I mean, right. in, it, across the board, every bank is exactly the same. Right. They all want a real holistic relationship right. in that situation. Now they're going to go for all those other product types. Right. Well, let's talk about another thing that's dear to the hearts and minds of the commercial real estate industry participants, and that's appraisals. And, you know, it seems like uh, sometimes I see appraisals are too high or too low. It seems like that, that world has kind of uh, been changing a lot. What are some of the trends you're seeing with appraisals right now that, that you're seeing? I think in most cases, the appraisal industry, not the users of the appraisal industry. The appraisal industry is is kind of sticking to the, their their discipline right now. Um, there's not a lot of real forward underwriting going on, and unless you have a turnaround value add type of deal, it's kind of an as is underwriting. Um, good discipline. Where where it gets dicey in the in the appraisal side is cap rates. And that's where you have kind of the tug of war between the lenders and the borrowers, where, where lenders kind of by and large are leery as to the, the long-term sustainability of cap rates, where we see cap rates today in some product types and in some locations, where you're seeing you know, high-end multifamily stuff going in the fours. Um, and that's no one questions. At least I don't think they question whether that's the cap rate today. today. Right. Okay. What they question as is how sustainable that cap yeah, rate in five is. Five years. Yes. Um, of course, the appraiser's job, though, is to value the property today. today. Right. Okay. So there and therein lies the battle right. there. And he, he's got five comps. They all look like they're good, solid comps. They tell you the cap rate should be five and a quarter or four and three quarters, whatever it is. You know, That's what he's going to use. That's what his metrics tell him. The lender, the user of the appraisal is like, ah, I'm not, you know, we, we, can't, we can't do a deal on a value that's based on a 475 cap rate. Can't do even that. Even that's what it's worth today. Even though that's what it's worth today. There's the battle that you have. Yeah. Um, you know, we hear anecdotally sometimes about people trying to influence appraisers on the, on, on the lending side. Uh, I think the borrowers, by and large, are kind of happy with the product they get out of the appraisers today. Yeah. The lenders are the ones that are kind of leery of maybe stuff being a little overvalued um, on a sustainable value. Yeah. Uh, well, that makes sense. What if you, uh, you're a borrower and you get an appraisal and you really don't agree with it? You think it's... Um, Let's say you think it's too too low. Uh, how many borrowers are saying, "All right, well, can we order another appraiser?" 
Um, a lot of bars want to do that, and it really depends on your lender. There, there's a regulatory aspect to that. Mm -hmm. A bank, for example, cannot throw that appraisal away and get another one. Okay. That appraisal may, is maintained as part of the file. You can't make pretend you didn't get it. Yeah. Okay. Now you may go for an alternative one, you know, and 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 you might have to explain the difference as to, as to why you picked appraisal B over appraisal A and and make your case as to why, but you can't make pretend that appraisal never existed. Uh, on I, I believe on the CMBS side. I don't. I can't. I can't really speak to that in the life insurance company side. I don't know the, that the rules are that strict there. Um, I mean, sometimes you get an appraisal in that neither party's happy with, <laughs> yeah. and, and and it might be that you just see God. He should have come up with a better comp list than this, yeah. or or why did he go geo spread so geographically? Well, sometimes far? the appraiser adjusts if you give him some good reasons. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I would say in, in, used to, you know, in, in almost all cases, and, and, and the appraiser is always welcoming more information. Yeah. The more information you can get them so they can make an accurate portrayal, they're, they're always welcome to do that. Well, Tom, thanks for joining us in Studio One. We appreciate you being yeah. here. My pleasure to be here, Michael. Well, Thank we you. always appreciate seeing you. Well, stay tuned. We'll have more on Show Me the Money. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Bull Realty, commercial real estate asset and occupancy solutions. Visit bullrealty.com. CCIM Institute, commercial real estate's global standard for professional achievement. Visit ccim.com slash CRE show. Excelligent, providing verified commercial real estate information across the United States. Visit excelligent.com.